So thank you all for having me today. Thank you for coming. I hope today is informative for you. Um, when I was preparing for the talk, I wanted to do something really exciting and grab your attention and maybe do something funny, but I have not had nearly enough coffee. And the music helped, but it didn't do the trick. So I'm just going to start talking by, about creative works. Um, and I want to talk about first, you know, what is a creative work and um, why is it important for you to know? Um, my goal today is to leave you with a better understanding of how we can all be players in the creative economy. Um, and hopefully you'll leave with a few tools that you can use um, to help identify, protect, and commercialize your own creative works. To do so, I think it's helpful to start with um, a definition of what a creative work is. One popular definition of a creative work is a manifestation of creative effort that has a degree of arbitrariness such that it's unlikely or improbable that two people would create the same work. Um, for lack of a better description of what it is, um, I think this is enough for us to proceed through and talk about the importance of creative works. One way that we can measure the value of a creative work is the development, the advancement, and the preservation of our culture. Um, it's important. It enriches all of our lives. It enriches the dialogue between us as citizens. Um, and in fact, President Kennedy once said that the life of the arts is not an interruption or a distraction in the life of a nation, but it's very close to the center of the nation's purpose. And it's a test of the quality of its civilization. I think that's very well said. In a market-driven world, though, it's easy to lose sight of the other forms of value that these creative works have. As I said before, they enrich our lives. They comfort us when we're stressed out, watching a movie, reading a great book. Um, they push us to reach our full potential. Sometimes they just inspire us just by looking at them and experiencing them, listening to music. And they can even provide us with a way to challenge dogma. Creative works can take many forms. As Ashlyn was discussing before, they can be a number of things. They can be photos, paintings, sculptures, books, plays, robots, <laughs> uh, satirical commentary in the paper, um, just to name a few. Um, so the other way that creative works have been discussed is, um, is in their value associated with the creative economy. So in other words, money. Um, and that make, can make a difference for all of us. Um, some of the definitions of, of creative in the creative economy are cultural expression, as we've already touched on. But another way um, people describe a creative economy includes uh, intellectual invention, so the types of things that you typically see in an R&D function in a company. Um, regardless of the definition of a creative economy, though, there are three major players. There's creators, consumers, and supporters. Here at UNH, um, creative works are defined as works not covered by utility patents. Um, these creative works account for a third of all the disclosures that UNH Innovation receives over the last five years. Um, these creative works account for a third of all the licenses that are handled by UNH Innovation. And as you can see from this, in the last five years, those licenses have generated $740,000 for UNH. So it's not a small contribution. It's something that we could increase and, and do better with, but um, certainly nothing to sneeze at. Um, hopefully after today's symposium, you'll have a better feeling of what works are protectable um, using a variety of different intellectual property methods. Um, and then also, hopefully, you'll have a better understanding of which ones might benefit from commercialization. So when we look at the state of New Hampshire, we're going to take a broader view. We're not going to just look at licensing, we're, but we are going to still take a somewhat of a narrow slice, and we're going to look at the impact of cultural nonprofits. Um, and in 2009, that's the most recent data that I could find um, for New Hampshire, is that it, those cultural nonprofits employed over 3,000 people, and they contributed $278 million for New Hampshire state's economy. Um, I think we can see that these, um, these do have a great impact, but it, imagine the impact if we were also able to fold in the information from independent artists. We have a League of New Hampshire craftsmen that has over 750 juried members. They're clearly doing some work. Um, we have all the R&D functions. We have a lot of high tech in the state. Um, and then this also doesn't touch on any of the for-profit entities, whether those are for-profit colleges or for-profit businesses that do some of this um, cultural art production. If we take an even larger view and we look at the United States as a whole, uh, we have data from 2012, and we can see that arts and cultural production um, gave $700 billion to the United States economy, and that's 4.3% of the GDP, so that's pretty decent. I think it's a, incredibly interesting to look and see um, when you compare that to the next two in the list. That was construction 
and transportation and warehousing, and those are each about 500 billion. So it's a considerable chunk. So as I said before, I think it's clear that creative works are important to us as individuals, culturally, as citizens of the US, and just for our economy. They help us um, move forward. In fact, the birth of our nation, we, since then, we've appreciated the importance of these creative works. And Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution even lays out the genesis for copyright and patent law, which is to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And we'll discuss a little bit more about what that means. Uh, as a way of getting you to begin to think about creative works and how they might be protectable, um, and to help you stay awake, hopefully. Um, I have a few examples of some products that are protectable using multiple forms of intellectual property. Um, and I'd like to walk through them briefly and highlight the various forms. These forms of protection overlap and serve different forms and different purposes. Uh, creative works can be protected using a combination of different forms of IP. Patents, there are several different types of patents. The two. Um, the design patent is usually more likely to affect a creative work, but there may be some utilitarian function that you can capture as well. Um, trademarks uh, with a subheading of trade dress, that's a form of a trademark. Um, there's copyright and trade secrets. In a given situation, you may decide to pursue a particular form of IP protection for a variety of reasons. Um, the first is the cost of the protection. For some, depending on what your market might be and the exposure that you're hoping to have, the cost may be prohibitive. You're going to want to ba balance that against the benefits of protection. Some of the benefits include exclusivity. You can keep other people from doing certain things. Um, oftentimes, these uh, forms of protection don't give you the right to do anything, but they help you foreclose others from doing things. And so they give you a little bit of a market advantage. They also can provide you an ability to generate some revenue, maybe through licensing or assigning your rights. Um, they can also allow you to control the dissemination of your ideas and your creativity. So maybe you want to decide what markets you want to publish in or how you want your work to be portrayed. If you have these forms of protection, you can um, exert some control there. You want to also balance the costs and the benefits against the risks for not getting any protection. Um, some of those risks could be an inability to cross-license. Oftentimes, in certain technology areas, um, you might be, you and your competitor might be inching along the same track, and someone might come to you and say, you're infringing mine, and it's really nice to be able to lay on the table and say, well, how about mine? How about we have a deal? We cross-license to each other. If you haven't sought protection, you might just be in a place where you have to stop what you're doing, and that's what an injunction is, um, regardless of whether you've been doing it beforehand or not. <clears throat> you also want to consider your desired scope of protection. What is it exactly about the item, uh, the product, uh, that you want to protect. And you need to look at that through the eyes of what would infringement look like. Who are your infringers? And based on that, maybe decide what intellectual property protection works best for you. And lastly, personal beliefs. Um, there's the open source movement. There's things like that where people just have a fundamental belief that this stuff should be shared and open and that um, these protections are inhibiting creativity. Well, if that's your, if that's your starting point, then. <laughs> then not all of these will fit you, but some of them might, because you might be able to be creative. And I think Kristen will talk to that later today about the different ways that you can kind of walk that balance. So my first example uh, of a creative work that's protectable using a combination of um, IP rights is a Game of Thrones pop-up book. <laughs> um, so with a show of hands, um, who thinks that this is protectable using a design patent? How about, OK, great. How about trademarks? How about copyright? Excellent. So everyone who raised their hand was correct. <laughs> um, and I just walked through why. So for a design patent, that protects how an article looks, not what it does. So some of the requirements for a design patent are that it be new. No one has done this exact thing before. It has to be non-obvious, which means based on what is out there in the art already, this is not just an obvious uh, step beyond that which anyone could have seen. They're not going to give you exclusivity for 15 years if it's some incremental change. Um, it has to be an ornamental design of an article of manufacture. But interestingly enough, it doesn't have to be tangible. It could be something like a GUI interface, or, or GUI, actually, graphical user interface for a computer. It could be a little tiny um, button 
for, uh, in an app store. It can be something like that. So it doesn't have to be um, you know, tangible in the sense of an actual book that you can walk around with. Um, they cost about $1,000 or so. Basically, it's a series of drawings um, because you have to represent it in two-dimensional space. So depending on what it is you're trying to protect, you have to do um, particular drawings, and the cost can go up. Um, but again, you get 15 years of exclusivity. You can keep other people from making, using, or selling your invention. Um, but again, it does not give you the right to do anything. Um, some of the possible elements here that could be protectable um, might be the gears on the, on the book in the certain orientations. It might be the buckles. It might be that circular centerpiece. Or it might actually be, I'm not sure if you can see it in the picture, but there's kind of a, like a wrapping of leather that bound the edge of the book. Um, some of the limitations, though, to design patents is that the element that you're protecting can't be the only way of doing it. There's a lot of people talk about functionality. It's true. It, it, the element may be functional. It just can't be the only way of doing it. And a good example is you might be able to get protection for an oddly shaped tool that actually can act as a hammer. You wouldn't be able to protect the flat face because to drive a nail in, you need a flat surface. But the rest of the hammer, the aesthetical uh, you know, aspects of that might be protectable. Um, so here, the rope binding could be protectable as long as there's another way of binding the edge of that book. Um, if it was the only way that you could do it, then you would not be able to seek protection for that. So the scope of protection for a, a design patent, this is where I talked about before, where depending on what you think infringement's going to look like, you might choose this avenue. Basically, the way they look at a design patent infringement case is they look at what the prior art is. In other words, what already happened before, whether it's a published patent or it's out in the world, what exists already, what have you applied for? They put them beside each other, and they say, okay, which of these elements do, do not match? So any of the elements that they don't see uh, from the prior art that you have protected, those become the elements that get asserted against this potential infringer. And based on that, um, you, you can tell whether or not there's infringement. So there's somewhat of subjectivity um, involved there. But for the right thing, it can be incredibly valuable. So trademark is another way that we could protect this Game of Thrones pop-up book. Um, and as you'll learn in more detail later, trademarks are all about source identification. This is all about consumer protection. You want to be able to walk into a restaurant in Minnesota and New Hampshire and have the same experience. The burgers should taste the same. The people should be as polite. The cost should be roughly the same. This is about predictability for the consumer. So you want to know. It, it should tell you in its use who made it and what kind of quality, customer service, et cetera, you should expect from that good. Uh, HBO has over 25 trademarks for the Game of Thrones enterprise. Um, they have the word mark, which means just Game of Thrones in any font, any color, any format. And then they have this design Game of Thrones. And uh, trademarks are interesting because you pick a class of goods or services that you associate them with. So I might pick a Game of Thrones um, trademark to be used on lip gloss, like I have, and or entertainment services, or any number of other things, books, t-shirts, you can imagine, all the different ways. Um, and the scope of protection generally comes down to a likelihood of confusion. Again, this is about consumer protection. Is somebody going to be confused as to whether or not a good that says Game of Thrones on it came from HBO or somebody else? Um, and there's reasons from a business standpoint why that would matter, but um, also for the consumer protection, depending on what the goods are. There could be actually, um, could be very important. Uh, another aspect is copyright. I think we can all look at this and imagine at least a few ways that the copyright could protect this work. Um, copyright protects the original expressions of ideas once they're fixed in a tangible medium, but not the idea itself. So one of the examples I have here is uh, Khaleesi might be protected, but not a queen that has a bunch of dragons. So there's aspects that can be protected, but not the underlying uh, idea of them. Here, some of the protectable elements could be the text, the actual book, whether it's a novel, a manual, a screenplay. In this, I don't know <clears throat> exactly precisely what's in this book for topics, but the text. Certainly, the cover art could be protected. Uh, any other illustrations throughout the book could be protected individually or together. Um, the logo itself could be protected as uh, an ornamental design, um, or the paper, paper sculptures could also be protected. 
for copyright, as you'll learn again later today, um, they protect five different things. They protect against copying, distribution, public display, public performance, or the creation of derivative works. So copyrights can be incredibly valuable if you have them. Not only do they last for a very long time, but they give you a lot of flexibility in commercialization, a lot of different ways that you could market this. You could have different fields of use. You could have different licenses that are not competing to various people to do various things. Um, to Ashlyn's example before with the screenplay and the movie and the book, there's a lot of different things, let alone merchandising. There's a lot of ways that you could um, capitalize on that one work, one original work. So my second example is going to be Microsoft products, uh, Windows products in general. Um, and just as the previous example, this can be protected by all three. Um, I set it up that way. But it, it could be protected by all three. Uh, examples of IP protection that I'm discussing today. So the first one is going to be a design patent. Um, again, it protects what it looks like, not what it does. So again, it has to be new, non-obvious, it has to be an ornamental, um, and it has to be on some article of manufacture. Here we're talking about um, you know, both tangible and virtual. So it might be on the box for a good. You actually get a disk that you slide in. Or it might be a uh, user interface. It might be cloud and a cloud application. So, and that does not matter. Um, it could be either. Um, again, they cost thousands of dollars. The trick with these is because it's a series of two-dimensional images, the uh, animation has to be pretty precise. Um, there was a case with Sony and Ericsson where um, they had tried to protect um, an animation. They ultimately did get it, but they had to fight pretty hard. This was in Europe. Um, because initially what was submitted, that it was hard for the court to tell exactly what was changing. from. So you actually basically have to do it like a flip book. It has to be clear how the animation is proceeding through your, your images. Um, this one they have been working on. Um, I don't know that they have it yet. <clears throat> um, so again, the benefit can be several years. So that can, that can really help if it's something that's, if it's a really great animation and people really enjoy it. Um, there, um, you, again, you're going to need to co compare it to the prior art. A lot of the design patent aspects that have been going on in high tech, people are very clear about. It's the rounded edges on the phone, the central home button, things that we may not think are innovative. But when they looked at the prior art and they compared it to what Apple applied for, they thought that Samsung was infringing. And that was um, quite a lucrative case. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that is interesting about uh, the design patent, I went too far, um, is the functionality aspect. If you're going to protect the tiling, you may have trouble because there are multiple ways that you can have that kind of touch screen interface with separate applications. But it could, if I was on the other side, I could argue that there are a finite number of ways to set that up. Um, they, they did actually apply for this, um, but they also applied for it for trade dress, and that is where they've been more successful so far. Um, and I think it might have to do with that. <clears throat> so trademarks. Again, so um, they are source identification. I think it's pretty clear. You can see a window, whether it's a cloud on a hill. You can see there's a lot of different ways that we can see this motif, and we know exactly who, where it's coming from. Um, Microsoft has over 40 trademark applications um, for just Windows. Anything that says Windows in it or is the Windows motif. Um, they have the word mark. They have the design marks. They have eight different sounds. Some start with a whoosh. Some are in G chord, F chord, whatever. They are all, all different ones. And they have been working on getting the animation. Um, and they have the flying butterfly. They have a bunch of different animations that they're working on. Um, and again, Sony Ericsson was able to register one in Europe. So I think the idea of sensory marks and the idea of these non-traditional marks is moving through. Because people do identify source, and that's, that's their purpose. Um, so just because the trademark office has been traditionally looking for you to put something in front of them that fits on a two-dimensional piece of paper doesn't mean that that's where we'll stay. Um, there have been other non-traditional marks that are scents and flavors and things like that. Flavors have been more difficult only because, um, to your point before, they're natural. So even though it's a medicine that tastes orange and that's different and unique and you can tell the source, they tend to not want to take flavors out of, <laughs> out of the common usage. Um, but they have done so with scents. You can have scented thread and different things like that. So it can be, you can be pretty creative in your trademark. Um, 
So again, they have multiple classes for their marks. Um, not surprisingly, computer services and trade shows. They haven't go, gone so far as lip balm, but I guess if it was hip, then maybe they would. But um, I think there can be some strategy involved in that as well, depending on what classes you want to pick. You want to make sure you protected yourself. But uh, because it's a likelihood of confusion analysis, if people are coming at the protected classes that you have, that you can usually fend them off that way too, if you think people will be confused. So you may not have to register in every single class like McDonald's does. Um, so copyright. Uh, again, protects the original expressions. Um, I think everyone knows that copyright is protectable. Um, the, the software is protectable that way. You may, may or may not know there's an awful lot of activity in the software patent realm right now. They are on the, they've been on the fence for a while. Um, they, it, some of them make it through, some of them don't. I, I, think that's a, I think it's a bad investment for a company in a lot of ways. Um, there's a lot of money involved in it. There's a lot of years to, to getting the, securing the rights. Um, but you also have the ability with, with software where it work moves so quickly that 20 years of exclusivity is kind of a non-starter for you. You, do, you don't need that. You need more like five. Um, so copyright is usually the most cost-effective way to handle that. APIs, um, the Supreme Court has just been asked um, by Oracle uh, and Google to revisit this. Um, APIs may, in fact, be protectable. We don't know yet. They're still working on it. Um, manuals, of course, are protectable. The logos, again, as ornamental designs. And again, because you can protect against copying distribution and all these different things, um, you get a lot of bang for your buck. One of the limitations for copyrights is the merger doctrine. And that basically says if the function is, is so closely tied to your, um, your creative expression, then it may not be copyrightable in the first place. So hopefully that's piqued your interest uh, enough to learn more about creative works and how you can protect them. Um, we could walk through any number of these sorts of things, and I enjoy doing this. <laughs> so, um, just trying to think of the many, many ways that I can help my clients protect their work. Um, using overlapping protection has a lot of benefits. Um, obviously, the scope of protection is great. I mean, for example, in the footwear industry, you might find that um, you're making a shoe in China during the day, and then at night they turn it over and start printing it for your competitor and selling it at night. Trademarks might not work because a trademark, all they have to do is misspell the word, and then it's not your trademark, for example. But maybe a design patent would help you. Maybe trade dress would help you. Maybe it's the element of having a white toe and three stripes, for example, with Adidas. They've um, done very well having that um, trade dress protection. So thinking outside the box a little bit and trying to figure out the many, many ways that you might protect your work. and you know, again, doing that balancing act to find out what, did it, what your end goal is. Are you looking to license this? Do you just want to control the distribution of it? What is your goal? Um, so UNH Innovation is hosting today's symposium to support their mission, which, as you know, is to advocate for, manage, and promote UNH's intellectual property. Um, they strive to create partnerships between UNH and the business community uh, for licensing uh, UNH activities and supporting startup companies. Um, today's symposium uh, hopefully will be very exciting for all of you, and uh, depending on what track you're on, you'll either learn about copyright or trademark fundamentals. You'll learn about either fair use in copyright or open source. Um, you'll learn about the UNH IP policy, or you can join Tim and I, and we'll deconstruct a copyright license. Um, this could really go for any IP license, but copyright licenses for publishing contracts are <laughs> usually pretty egregious, so they're fun to pick apart. Um, and then lastly today you'll t uh, talk to, uh, Linda will speak about commercializing creative works. So regardless of the track you're on, um, I hope you come away with a deeper understanding of what creative works are, how you might protect them, um, and um, how important they are for us as individuals, how, they, how important they are for UNH, New Hampshire, the U.S., the world. <laughs> These are pretty cool things. So I want to have, give you a call to action. I want you to be creative in the way that you interact with the creative economy. Um, whether you replace a broken bowl with one that's handmade, buy a print for your office or your home, attend a play, a concert, eat at a local a restaurant with a new, cool new chef doing funky things, um, you're making a valuable contribution not to just enriching your own life but into promoting the arts and supporting the economy. Uh, there's no wrong way to do it. Be a creator, be a consumer, be a supporter. Um, and I just want to thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, or I'm also happy to turn you over to coffee and more breakfast before you go to your next thing. Yes. Hi, Stan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes.
Yes. Yes. And he said, copyright is original just by originality. Yeah. Design the patent just by novelty. Yeah. Can you tell us what the difference is between those two? Um, that's tricky. <laughs> um, I, you know, the way I equate novelty, and it's, it, I, it kind of, it kind of belittles it a little bit, but the way I talk about it usually in a simplistic way, is um, if you invented a red doorknob and all the doorknobs before you were blue, that's new, right? It's not particularly non-obvious or creative, really, because you just changed the color. Um, the same way as if all the doorknobs had been glass and you decided you were going to make a metal one. I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing where novelty is pretty easy uh, hill to get over, I think. I think in the patent context, it's non-obvious. And I think, to be completely frank with you, obviousness in an aesthetic context is anybody's guess, right? Because the whole idea is it's a creative, it's a, again, it's a creative expression of something. Um, so I think you know, there's some famous case law where there's a couple of different um, benches, and there's some scroll work done, and, and there's some different things like that. And, you, and depending on who you are, I swear, if you lay them beside each other, you either think, oh, those look the same, or wow, see the difference there. Um, and they, the, one of the most famous cases was with uh, silver spoons. Uh, and again, I think on any given day, I can see it differently. Uh, there are certainly some motifs between the two spoons, I should have I brought that, um, that are different and, and new, but I don't know that they're not obvious. Um, you know. That's right. I think that's also a fairly low bar. I mean, I think where you get into is, um, you know, whether or not the fun it's so functional that you have the merger problem. But I think the creativity bar is pretty low. And actually, copyrights really aren't examined. I mean, I've had one kicked back, but it was pretty obvious it should get kicked back. Um, but it was, we gave it a shot. Um, it was a, a funky, uh, like, dictionary in a weird language that no one speaks. So we thought, well, let's try it. Um, but it... Um, but there very little uh, examination, and I think that's reflected in the cost. I mean, they're around thirty-five to eighty dollars to to get a copyright protection. So, um, where the difference is when you're in the design patent realm, you know, someone is actually really looking at that, and so I think it's a higher bar. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> That's right, and I think I think at least from where I sit, I, I find it's as instructive uh, to look at who who are your infringers going to be, what is it you're trying to get to, what kind of breadth are you looking for, are you looking for the comparison between the prior art and yourself? I mean, it, were you were you enough of a leap that you feel like you can get some pretty broad protection out of the design patent, or are you on a on a thread and you really want it, or is the kind of infringement going to be a direct copy? For example, software, that's your problem. They're going to burn it directly and distribute it. So you know that's really what you want to be. You don't want to be comparing and contrasting, and you know that's not going to help you uh, as much. But. So, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have fun today.